You know, it's worth saying that it might seem a little bit surprising that we're talking about happiness at Zeitgeist, because if you talk to lay people on the street and you ask them about happiness, which I do, what you'll often hear is folks say, well, I'll be happy once I'm successful. I'll be happy once I'm making some money. I'll be happy if I'm in the C-suite. I'll be happy if I'm an Instagram influencer. If I could go to Google Zeitgeist, then I would be happy. They don't say the last thing. They do say influencer. But what's weird is that all of you in this room are those things. And you know this is a talk on happiness, and you haven't like skedaddled out to go surfing. You're like sticking around to see what I'm going to say. And that should be surprising, but it's not actually surprising to me, because I actually hang out with a whole host of successful folks who also struggle with their happiness. Um, I'm a professor at this lovely school at Yale University. I've been teaching there for over a decade. But in just the last couple years, I took on a new role on campus. I became a head of college. So I like, live in this beautiful quad with students. I see them in the dining hall, and I was seeing the college student mental health crisis up close and personal, where right now, not just at Yale, but nationally, over 40% of college students report being too depressed to function most days. Over 65% say that they're overwhelmingly anxious, and more than one in 10 has seriously considered suicide in the last year. So if you have children who are in high school or college, that's the population you're dealing with. If you're an employer, this is the population that you're going to be hiring in the next three to five years, right? This is the crisis that we're dealing with in terms of mental health. And it was a crisis that I was facing in my community. So I wanted to do something about it. And being a nerdy professor, I said, well, what I will do is I will develop a class where I teach students strategies they can use to kind of hack their happiness. We know lots of strategies we can engage in. We just have to put them into effect. But it was like a new class on campus. I didn't know many students were going to take it. I thought 30 kids would show up. You kind of heard in the intro the, like, you know, the bunch line. Just like way more than 30 kids showed up. Um, a quarter of the entire campus decided to take this class and learn what they could do to feel happier, which was a logistical nightmare that we don't have to get into. Um, but I hope you're all saying, this class sounds great. Could I potentially take this class? And the answer is yes. In the next 17 and 0.48 minutes, I'm going to try to do a zeitgeist first. I'm going to give you a whole Ivy League class in 17 plus minutes. Um, that unfortunately means we got to like speed through super fast. So I know the break is coming up, but like hope you're all with me. We're going to do the listicle version. I'm going to go through the top five insights that I teach my students. Starting with the insight that I think is most important, which is that if you want to take the science seriously, you need to realize that our minds kind of lie to us when it comes to happiness. It's kind of a strange notion, but the idea is that we're walking around with these big brains, fantastically smart, but these brains actually have intuitions about the sorts of things we can do to feel better. Right? If I do this, I will feel happy. If I get this thing, I'll feel happier. And what the science has shown is that, by and large, many of those intuitions about the things we could get that would make us happy, they just seem to be wrong. Like, let's take some really basic ones. Money. The intuition is like, if I just get more of this, I'll be happier. And that is true if you are living at lower incomes. But the evidence from two Nobel Prize winning psychologists suggests that if you're earning about 75 k right now in the US, doubling or quadrupling your income won't have any impact on your happiness, which is what the data suggests, right? You can go out and study people who have all the stuff that like, money can buy, like you know, fancy planes and all these things. And what you find is they're no happier on average than the average person who's earning 75 k This is true not just of material possessions, but of accolades. I think we're always constantly in this race to get to the next thing, to get to the next promotion, to get to like 11 on whatever we're going for in life. But the data really suggests that once you get to 11, it's not going to work in the way you think. This is what researchers call the arrival fallacy. I'll be happier when I get there, but you're never as happy as you think. And you might say, like, that sucks. It should be the case that good things in life do bring us happiness. What's going on? And that's big insight number two that I want to walk through, which is that there's this bias of the mind that's known as hedonic adaptation. And it's what's messing us up in terms of happiness. What is hedonic adaptation is that we adapt to our hedonic circumstances, or perhaps more like colloquially put, we just get used to stuff. Wonderful things in life, they're wonderful when we first get them, but when they stick around, their wonderfulness kind of wanes, right? This is why money doesn't make us as happy as we think. And we can study hedonic adaptation in money, which is what many psychologists do. One of my favorite studies asks the following question, what if I could give you an annual salary check right now, every year for the rest of your life, that was so high you'd never need a dollar more? How much would you need? Right? And so we can ask folks who are earning different amounts of money, what if you're earning 30K, is that enough? 
These folks say, no, but if I was earning 50K annually, I'd never need another cent, right? So we should find the folks earning 50K, and they should be like, totally thrilled. Uh, researchers do one better. They find folks earning $100,000. These folks should be like, it's piling up in my living room. I don't know what to do with it. But they don't, surprisingly, perhaps say that. They say that what they need to feel happy is $250,000. And you're all smirking, which means you're great at math, even in this late part of the afternoon. It's not that you get to the destination as you get more. You get further away from the destination. That's hedonic adaptation and action, and it works not just for money, but all the things that money can buy. Your house kind of sticks around. You get used to it. My colleague, uh, Dan Gilbert at Harvard, often quips that when we buy a new car, we want one that's going to last. But in terms of our happiness, that's the worst thing a car can do, because it will stick around to disappoint you. It'll just be this <laughs> boring car that sucks over time. But it's not just the money and the material goods in life. Every kind of mountain we get to the top of we're constantly, immediately kind of bored with that mountain we're at and looking to the next one, which in some ways is good. It means we kind of keep pushing, but it's really terrible for our happiness because we don't really enjoy the journey. And so you might be saying, this sucks, hedonic adaptation sounds pretty crappy. What can we do to fight it? We can't shut it off, but we might be able to do things to fight it in certain ways. And the science suggests that one powerful way we can fight hedonic adaptation is to take time to appreciate the kinds of things that we do have, to be grateful for the journey, to be grateful for the stuff we have. It's nice if you're sort of naturally in a mindset of gratitude, but if you're not, there's a quick hack you can do, which is to bring yourself into that mindset. The quick act of, for example, scribbling down three to five things that you're grateful for every night. Sounds very cheesy and hippy-dippy. I guess we're in California, so it's cool for hippy-dippy, but sounds like us, uh, hippy-dippy. Evidence suggests that in as little as two weeks, this will statistically improve your life satisfaction. Just a simple act of scribbling down a few things that you're grateful for. But really hacking hedonic adaptation as our top tip number three, which is that we need to start making sure that we're investing in the stuff that we're not going to get used to, right? And that means your money and your time, right? What's the stuff we get used to? We talked about it, cars. Going to stick around to disappoint you. But it turns out if you invest in experiences, things like, you know, going on some cool trip, like engaging in, like, some fun concert, right? Like watching cool stuff, going to art, delicious wine, right? These are things that don't last long enough for you to get used to them. Or maybe that's because I'm academic. You all are C-suite, so maybe you buy bottles of wine that last like months long. Mine, I'm going to drink it pretty quickly, right? It's not going to stick around to disappoint me, and that is a good thing about experiences. The evidence suggests investing in experiences will continue to boost your happiness. But another thing we can invest in that we forget is the power of time. There's a lot of work in social science right now about what's called time affluence. Not wealth affluence, but this subjective sense that you're wealthy in time, that you can, you're not sort of feeling what a lot of us experience, which is time famine, where you're like starving for time. You don't know where you're going to squeeze in that next meeting. And time famine has a huge hit on our well-being. In fact, one study found that if you self-report being time famished, that's as bad a hit on your well-being as if you self-report being unemployed. And we just were reminded of 2008 and all the unemployment and all the devastation it did to our well-being. Just being too busy causes that same devastation. And you might be saying, that's really bad because I'm busy all the time, right? Whether it's you know, with childcare kind of stuff or just pushing yourself towards those accolades or that money, which we just saw aren't gonna, isn't going to work for your happiness bracketed, but push, 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 that means you don't have any time for yourself. So how can you hack your time affluence? Well, one strategy is to use the money that many of you have to get back more time. Evidence suggests that spending money to get time back can be a powerful way to improve your overall time affluence, and it's like a good way to spend your money to get back happiness. But my favorite hack towards getting time affluence is to make good use of the time we actually have. Turns out if you do time sampling studies of people nowadays, they have, on average, more time than they did 10 or 20 years ago. We don't predict that. We think we're busier than ever, but the time studies suggest we're not. The problem is that the time we do have is broken up into really stupid pieces of time, like that five minutes when the, the meeting ends earlier, the 10 minutes when your like, kid falls asleep. That's what researcher Ashley Willens calls time confetti little pieces of time that are floating around. And you get them, and you don't think they're that important, so you kind of fling them around, right? Like you check your email or do something stupid. But the evidence suggests if you could make good use of your time confetti, 
ideally use it for something that's going to improve your well-being, you not only get a boost to your well-being, but you'll start to feel a little bit less time famished. And that lack of time famine can really improve your well-being. So find those little scraps that you're throwing around and do something good with it. In fact, researcher Ashley Willens recommends making a time confetti wish list. So like a to-do list that you have, but not to like work to-dos, but what you will do when you get some time. Right? And you can invest in lots of things with your time confetti, but a fantastic thing to invest your time confetti in is social connection. The other thing we should really be investing in, every available study of happy people suggests that happy people are more social. They prioritize time with their friends and family members and the people they care about. And they're also just other-oriented generally. They kind of are happy in part because they care not about their own happiness, but about other people's happiness. And that gets to our fourth insight, which is that this idea of kind of self-care that we hear a lot about, I think it's a bit of a misnomer, because if you look at happy people, happy people aren't so focused on themselves. They're constantly focused on other people. But this isn't the cultural message we get these days. You know, if you watch Parks and Rec, you've heard of like, treat yourself. I bet in the Goop store you could probably buy a pillow or something that says treat yourself, right? But this is what we think. We think if I were having a bad day, we want to invest time and money in ourselves. But if you look at studies of happy people, that's not the way happy people are spending their time. Happy people are constantly doing things for other people. Now you might say, that's because they're happy. I feel crappy. I don't want to help anybody else, right? <laughs> Fair enough. I'm with you. But there's experimental evidence that if you force people to do nice stuff for others, they in turn will feel happier. One of my favorite studies by Elizabeth Dunn and her colleagues does this in a cute way. They walk up to college students on the street, hand them 20 bucks. It's an awesome study for college students to be in because they're like, 20 bucks? But the key is that the researcher tells the student how to spend it. She either says, by the end of the day, you need to spend this money on yourself, or by the end of the day, you need to spend this money on someone else, do something nice for somebody else. And what she finds is at the end of the day, and even at the end of the week, students who spent the money on somebody else were happier, which is pretty cool. But spending on others doesn't just increase your happiness, it's also a fantastic way to reduce stress. I bet when Sanjay comes up later, we're going to hear about the connection between stress and stress-related illnesses, all these bad things it does to our body. That's a consistent like, relationship, stress, bad, bad effects on our body. But if you pull out people who self-report that they spend a lot of time doing meaningful things for other people, you don't see that relationship as significantly. In other words, people, have, people are stressed, they experience stress, but they don't have the stress-related illnesses, just because they're kind of focused on other people. So it's good for our happiness, but it might also be good for our longevity and our bodies, too. And so that's top insight number four. We've got to get out of this kind of self-care mindset and go to a mindset of being other-oriented. Now we get to the final tip, which might be the hardest, but it harkens back to something that Amanda was talking about and Blessing was talking about earlier, so I love that they kind of set me up so nicely for this, which is that if we want to be happier, we need to kind of be present for the good and bad parts of the journey. We already talked about how we're not so good at being present for the good parts of the journey, right? Hedonic adaptation means get to this point in the mountain, you just want to go to the next one, right? You're not there to savor and be present and be, have, be grateful for the good things. But an even bigger problem for our happiness is that we don't like being there for the bad things. We really kind of want to avoid emotions that sort of look like this. Problem is, I don't know what your emoji list looks like lately, but mine has a lot more of these ones in the last couple years than it does the positive ones, right? Like, it's just like, we got to call a spade a spade. Like, this is a, a tough time. Like, we are all feeling anxious and frustrated. There's like real scary stuff out there. It's normative to feel bad. Problem is we don't like feeling bad, and so our instinct is to just shut off the bad feelings as quickly as possible. Suppress our emotions, stiff upper lip, whatever expression you want to use. Our mind, this kind of lying mind, thinks that's going to work, but the evidence suggests it doesn't work in the way we think. In fact, one study by the Stanford neuroscientist James Gross had people in a laboratory task watch sad videos on YouTube and told subjects, whatever you do, make it so that no one knows you're feeling sad. Try to suppress that emotion as much as possible, right? What happens? Well, these subjects wind up showing cognitive changes. They actually do worse on a memory test later on. They do worse on a risk-taking test. So if you want to screw up your risk-taking in an economic sense, one really way, good way to do that is to suppress your emotions. But you also see physical changes when subjects do this task. You see signs of cardiac stress in these subjects who do this simple laboratory task of suppressing a, a sad YouTube video. Right? Imagine what we're doing, like thinking about that, like you know, Ukraine and the economy and all this stuff all the time, right? So suppressing is bad, but you might say then, like, well, what do we do with negative emotions? And unfortunately, this isn't a talk about getting rid of negative emotions. 
It's kind of heralding the negative emotions to say they're here for a reason, and we need to pay attention to them. But we need a good strategy to do that. And to do so, I think we need to harness our inner beetle. And when we face negative emotions, we have to say, we're going to let it be. Or, as more nerdy social scientists talk about it, we have to engage in what's known as radical acceptance. We just have to say, yeah, times are crappy, I'm feeling fear, I'm feeling frustration, and that's the way it is, right? But, of course, that's hard. And so we might need a good strategy to help us do that. And I'll leave you with one meditation strategy that I and my students find really powerful. It's a strategy for radical acceptance that goes by the acronym of RAIN. It's one that's been popularized by the meditation teacher Tara Brach, and it goes something like this. Imagine that you experience a negative emotion. You read a frustrating email, you see some news, maybe there's a session at Zeitgeist that you're like, oh, my stomach's feeling not so great. You say, aha, that Yale lady said to do RAIN. And you say, huh, do rain. And you start with the first letter of the acronym, which is to recognize. Recognize what emotion you're dealing with. And, and this is like if you have little kids, you might have heard this expression like, use your words. You tell your kids, use your words. Use your words. You're all incredibly creative people. What emotion is it? Is it frustration with a side of overwhelm? Is it like pissed with a little bit of sadness and dread? Like, get creative and say what it is. That's the first step R. But the next step, the A, is the harder one, and that is to allow. You say, I'm just going to allow this emotion to be there just as it is. I don't have to love it, but I'm just going to hang out with it for a little while. Um, I don't know if any of you like, live in the suburbs, but sometimes if you live in the suburbs, you have that nosy neighbor who you're like, just outside like, getting something for your car, and the neighbor comes, and they want to talk to you, and you're like, I don't want to talk to this person. But you don't like, kick them out, or you're not mean to them. Like, go away! Like, I hate you, suppress you. You say, you just talk to them, and you like, deal with it, right? That's what you're doing with your emotions, right? You're just going to hang out. They're annoying. You're just going to let it be, whatever. But the key is that you give your mind something to do while you're dealing with that emotion. And that's the next step in RAIN, the I investigate. With some kind of interest and care, turn on your inner journalist. What does this emotion feel like in your body, right? Is your chest getting tighter? Maybe your brow's furrowing. Maybe you have a craving. You want to take a drink or check your email or do anything but be with that emotion. That's cool. Just notice and pay attention. And the I step is powerful because evidence suggests that emotions work kind of like a wave. Cravings and things work like this, too, whereas you start paying attention to them, they feel more intense for a bit. But then if you're really hanging out with them and not suppressing them, they will subside, often in as little as like five to 10 minutes. And the eye just gives you something to do like while you're doing that. It also trains you to pay attention like, oh, when I get pissed, this is what happens in my body. You can start recognizing it faster without rain. But you don't stop there because negative emotions suck. Even once the wave has passed, there's still one more step to rain, and that's the last step, the end, to nurture. Negative emotions kind of suck, right? What can you do to nurture yourself? Take something off your plate, call a friend, scribble in a gratitude journal, go for a walk on the beach. Like, what can you do to just give yourself a little self-compassion and take care of yourself? Again, practices like these don't have great marketing. They sound kind of cheesy, but the evidence suggests that practices like RAIN can reduce burnout in first responders. They can reduce negative emotion in palliative care workers who are dealing with death all the time. So if they're powerful in those industries, it can be incredibly powerful to kind of find ways to hang out with our negative emotions, even if we don't feel like it. And so that was Top Insight number five. You did a whole Yale class in 17 minutes. That's amazing. You can talk to the Zeitgeist folks about college credits or transfers or whatever. Um, but what I hope I've done is to convince you that even though you all have all the kinds of things that many lay people might think of in terms of happiness, if you're not feeling happy, you're not doing something wrong. It's just your brain is kind of wrong. Your brain is giving you the wrong intuitions. But the amazing thing about science, and social science in particular, is that if we understand how those intuitions go astray, if we understand the biases we're working with, we can hack them. We can't totally shut them off, but we can work with them to gain the happiness that we should all be getting from fantastic circumstances in life, from all the successes you experience. Thank you all so much.